April 15th, 1865. Not tax day. Anybody know what happened on that day? President Abraham Lincoln assassinated. Anybody there? Some historians have called it the most tragic day in our nation's history. December 7th, 1941. Guessing a few of you know that date. The day that the Japanese armed forces bombed Pearl Harbor. The day that our president at the time, Roosevelt, called a day that will live in infamy. November 22nd, 1963. Some of you know that day. The day that President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Also the day that C.S. Lewis died. But nobody talks about that. <laughs> he was assassinated in Dallas, Texas, and some have called that the saddest day in the history of our country. September 11, 2001. We all know that date. Probably know where you were. Terrorists attacked the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York City and the Pentagon in Arlington, Virginia, resulting in the loss of nearly 3,000 U.S. lives. The most shocking day in our country's history. What we're going to talk about is what I would call the most infamous, tragic, sad, and shocking day in the history of the world, or the events leading up to it. The day that the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the creator of all that exists, was put on trial by a human court and condemned to die. Of course, as Christ followers, we know uh, how, that our God took these tragic, shocking, sad, and infamous events and transformed them into our salvation, right? We know that. We celebrate that. And we'll do that in a week. But I want to focus in on a particular aspect of that fateful day. The trial of Jesus before a man named Pontius Pilate. I want to examine that trial. And because what it really is, is a character study of this man named Pilate. It's an examination of his heart and mind and what was going on with him. And really, if we're honest with ourselves and pay attention, it's also an examination of our own hearts and our own minds. Jesus, a little background, most of you know the context here, but for those of you that might not, Jesus has been arrested and he's been betrayed by Judas, one of his 12 disciples. He's been arrested in the garden. He's been dragged away in the middle of the night to the court of the high priest. We talked about that last week. And he stood trial before the high priest in the middle of the night, and then before a group called the Sanhedrin, that was the Jewish High Council, kind of like the Supreme Court and Congress combined with religious authority thrown in. And the Jewish system of law, or jurisprudence, if you will, is based on a couple of Old Testament passages. For those of you that like to study these things, Deuteronomy 16, verses 18 through 20, is sort of the centerpiece of civil law for the Jewish the nation of Israel. Appoint yourselves judges over, over you who will judge righteously, not distort justice. Be impartial and never accept bribes. In small villages, those appointed judges were the village elders, synagogue elders. In fact, you'll read the New Testament about the elders coming out of a village to greet people. Those were the elders of the village appointed to not only carry out religious duties, but also to administer civil justice. In Jerusalem, that group was called the Sanhedrin. 70 members plus one. You have to have an odd number, right, if you're going to vote. So you don't have split decisions. 70 members plus one, the one being the high priest. And the first century documents tell us there were rules for how the Sanhedrin would operate. How they, how they, what they could and could not do in um, meeting out justice. And this will sound very familiar to you. It sounds a lot like our system of justice. For one thing, there could be no secret proceedings Trials had to be conducted by day and in public. Second, there was a right of defense for the accused. Somebody had to defend them. And no sentence, number three, could be, uh, no conviction could be handed down without at least two or three credible witnesses. Now, if you know your New Testament story of Jesus' trial by the Sanhedrin, all three of those were horribly violated. In the middle of the night, in secret, no defense, and no witnesses that were credible. But they do not have the authority, because Jerusalem and Israel is an occupied nation under Rome. They don't have the authority to hand down the death sentence, which is what they want, which is why they broke all those rules, right? So they drag him away to a man named Pilate, 
the procurator or the governor over Judea. Let's, if you have your Bible, open to John chapter 18. If not, look behind my head. Verses uh, 28 through 32. John chapter 18, beginning verse 28. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters, so they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. We'll pause there. We're, we're going to walk right through a number of texts in John 18 and 19, looking at each part of this trial as, as we go. Um, I want you to notice something right off the bat. The Jewish authorities do not even have a charge. You notice that? They, bring, they, say, they, they just present him to Pilate to be put condemned to death, and Pilate says, on what grounds? And they say, don't worry about that. We wouldn't have brought him here if he wasn't guilty. Just trust us and put him to death. They don't, in fact, they couldn't even agree amongst themselves what the charge was. And you'll see the charge will change as the story goes on. Pilate tries to dismiss it as a Jewish matter, right? You deal with it. What do I have to do with this? You deal with it. And they say, we don't have the authority to put him to death, which is what we want. That's why we brought him to you. They appeal to the law, in other words. What we're going to see over and over and over again here is that Pilate does everything he can to get out from under the question of Jesus. To get rid of this man and this issue. But he can't. In the end, he cannot escape the question of what to do with Jesus. And I would suggest in the end, neither can you. Neither can any man or woman. And so it is with every one of us. Let's look again at the story, pick it up in verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from this world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? This is a fascinating little encounter. I wish we had more time to spend on just this passage alone. Pilate's first question is one that he knows the answer to. Are you a king of the Jews? He knows that that's the rumor. He knows that that's one of the accusations. But he wants to hear Jesus say it because that's the only grounds on which Pilate could condemn him, right? He's, if he's not a threat to Caesar or the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, then Pilate has nothing to do with this guy. So he wants to hear him say it. And Jesus says, who told you that? Where are you getting your information, in other words? And Pilate is like exasperated. What, I'm not a Jew. This is not my business. What did you do? Why did they bring you to me? If then Jesus, in this amazing part in verse 36, says, If my kingdom, my kingdom is not of this world, for if it was, my followers would be fighting right now. Think about that for a minute. If Jesus' kingdom was just of this world, just a political kingdom, just a military kingdom, just a social justice kingdom, just an earthly kingdom like all other kingdoms or governments or social systems before or since, then all that would have been accomplished would be the overthrow of Rome. The liberation of Israel from Roman occupation. But God has a much bigger agenda in mind. He has much bigger plans. And I would suggest you and I would do well to remember that in our current political climate. God has a bigger agenda in mind than anything we can fathom. We'll move on. Then Pilate asked the question. He, Jesus says, I've come to give witness to the truth and those who listen to my voice know the truth. And Pilate says, with uh, it's obvious sarcasm, what's truth? He knows the religious leaders are not concerned with the truth. He's been around enough to know and risen up to the ranks in the political system to know that truth is kind of what you make it. 
it's to be massaged and used in your favor. Yet there's also a part of him that I think genuinely wants to know. What's the truth? He's not a man, Pilate, without some sense of truth and justice. We see this in the fact that five times in this account, he's going to say, I find no fault in this man, Jesus. He's going to say over and over again, I find no guilt in him. I find no reason to condemn him. So he cares to a certain degree about truth. Let's pick up the story again with the second half of verse 38 through first five verses of chapter 19. And after he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one a man for you at Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, king of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. In Latin, ecce homo. It's the phrase for the whole series we're in. Behold the man. Now, twice in this passage, Pilate says, I find no fault in Jesus. The custom, by the way, you know the story of Barabbas, the custom of releasing a prisoner was one that predated Pilate's arrival on the scene in Israel and in Jerusalem, in that region. It was, a, it was obviously a, con- a concession to the Jewish people made by Rome to keep the peace. And other gospel writers inform us that the people, the Jewish people, were the ones who chose who to have released. So Pilate has an idea. Remember, what's, what's happening here? The question of Jesus becomes inescapable. He's already said, you deal with him. And they say, we can't, because we can't crucify him. He's questioned Jesus and says, what is truth? I find no fault in him. He, so then he tries to release him with, with, by offering him in comparison to Barabbas. Barabbas, we know, was a robber. Other texts say that he was an insurrectionist. He was a murderer and a thief. A notorious bad guy that the Jews wanted locked up. Pilate, I think what's going on in his mind is like, I got this. I know the answer. It was only a few days ago they were cheering Hosanna to this guy, and now they want him dead. But I don't think the mob is really that bloodthirsty. If I offer him in comparison to this one, who everyone knows is a dangerous criminal, then clearly they'll choose Jesus, and I'll be off the hook. Right? I think that's what's happening here. It's not a bad idea by Pilate. And in verse 40, they say, Not this man, give us Barabbas. I think if you've ever seen a double take, you would have seen Pilate be like, just stunned. What? What? You don't want Jesus? You want Barabbas released? But that's the mood of the mob. That's the mood of the crowd. Whatever way the wind is blowing, right? That's what they want. Pilate still cannot escape the question of Jesus. What he does next, I think, shows us just how desperate he is. Look at verses 1 through 3 of chapter 19. Pilate, it's not on the screen, but you turn back in your Bibles. Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and arrayed him in purple robe. They came up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, mocking him, and struck him with their fists. He flogged him. Some of your Bibles might say scourged him. The old King James says chastised him. What does this mean? Roman scourge was a horrific process. Some of you have seen or read about it. It was done with a flagrum. A flagrum was a uh, long, a thick stick, about, about 12 to 14 inches long, wrapped in leather. On the end of it were a number of leather uh, straps, like a whip, short whip. The end of each of those straps were tied knots. At the very end were tied pieces of bone or iron or lead, metal. Some of you have heard about this. If you've seen The Passion of the Christ, you know about this and you've seen it. The condemned, this was, this was a precursor to crucifixion. It was to speed up the process of death. The condemned was either uh, raised with arms stretched, uh, like racked, or stretched over a stone or, or, or a log, so their back was bowed and exposed. And then somebody who was an expert in these things, the Romans, were, they were well studied in how to extract the most amount of pain without killing a person, would strike the condemned 40 lashes minus one, 39 times with the flagrum. It was, the whole thing was designed for maximum f- damage to the human flesh and maximum blood loss so that when you went to the cross, it wouldn't last all day. That's what he does to Jesus. 
It's a hideous torture. So bad that Roman citizens, by law, were not allowed to be scourged. No matter their crime, they couldn't be scourged. So Pilate figures, I can't get rid of this man. I can't get rid of him, even when I compare him to Barabbas. Maybe if I, if I beat him up, maybe if, if I extract a little, uh, uh, some blood, if I bloody him, that'll satisfy them. And I won't have to kill him. Because he says, I find no fault in him. This is clearly an attempt at compromise, isn't it? Okay, all right, I'll go this far. I'll give in this far. Jesus bore our sin, we read. We sung the songs. We read about the, him bearing our sin. We think of that happening at the cross. I think he began to bear our sin here. You know, Isaiah chapter 53, if you read Isaiah chapter 53, the prophet is, is talking about the one who will die in our place, and he gives very specific prophetic references to how Jesus would die. And in, in chapter 53, verse 5, he says, Upon him was the punishment or chastisement that brought us peace, and by his stripes, wounds, we are healed. I think it begins here. In verse 4, he says, he brings him out. Think about the scene here. Purple robe stuck to the, to the ripped flesh in his back. Crown of thorns jammed down on his head. Blood streaming down his face, pooling at his feet. He's probably, from being punched in the face and whipped, almost unrecognizable. Brings him out. Behold the man. Right? He doesn't say, hail king of the Jews. He's like, he's just a man. See, this guy's no threat. You see, he's not an insurrectionist. He's no threat to Caesar or to you or to me. Isn't this enough? Let him go. In other words. Pilate says, I'll bring him out again to show you I find no fault in him. You see the irony there? He just had him beat within an inch of his life, and he says, I find no fault in him. Behold the man. Let's pick it up again in John chapter 19, verses 6 through 11. So Jesus, excuse me, verse 6. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Once again, Pilate says, I find no fault in the man. I find no guilt in him. He tries to pass the whole issue off. Like, isn't this enough? And once again, he cannot escape the question of Jesus. It keeps coming to him. In verse 8, when they say we have a law, right, that the one who's claimed to set himself up as God must be condemned. And then verse 8 says Pilate was even more afraid when he heard this. Have you ever wondered that? What does that mean? He was even more afraid. To be more afraid means to beginning your what? You're afraid. So he's been desperate and afraid this whole time. And now he's even more afraid. There's something very interesting happening here. I don't know if you know the history of Pilate and and um, what's going on with him. Ancient Jewish and Roman historians, Philo, Pliny the Elder, and Josephus, I'm sure you have those on your shelves at home, and uh, Eusebius, tell us a little bit about Pilate's background. Pontius Pilate was sent to Rome, and he was, um, that, 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 or sent to, sent to Judea, excuse me, from Rome, and that was not like a promotion. To be sent to be governor of Judea over the contentious Jews in sort of backwater area of the Roman Empire was not like a big, that was sort of where you went if you were a troublemaker. If you were a, um, an aspiring nobleman, you wanted to be in Rome or near it or on the front lines of what, of what the Roman Empire was expanding. This was, this was not a good post to have. So it tells us already he's, he's had himself in a little bit of trouble, and we read about that in these historians. We also know that he'd had several warnings from Caesar. Tiberius was Caesar at this time. That he'd been warned several times for his rough treatment of the Jews. When he first showed up, he had his uh, bannermen bring in his standards with Caesar's face and some of the Roman gods on them into the holy city, into the temple courts. It caused a revolt, a riot among the Jews. And they were trying to stop him. And he had his men, his armed soldiers, at the point of spears and swords, threatened to kill all the Jews unless they dispersed. And they laid down the temple courts and refused to leave. Huge revolt and riot, word spread to Rome, Caesar warned him. Then later on, he was trying to extract 
uh, gold and silver from the temple to pay for an aqueduct project. We read about this in Josephus' writings. And um, the Jews revolted again. And he, in, in fact, in Luke chapter 13, Jesus mentions when Pilate slaughtered those Galilean Jews who were making their sacrifices. He goes into the temple and taking gold, and, and while they're making their sacrifices, he kills a bunch of men and women worshiping. This is not a kind-hearted guy when it came to getting his way. And this one, he was called back to Roman and reprimanded. So he's on his, like, two strikes, right? Third strike coming. So when they say, we have a law that someone who sets themselves up as God must be killed, Pilate is even more afraid. Why? Because he knows what this, if, if he doesn't give in here, what would this mean? Revolt, riot, bloodshed, and not just a loss of his job, but maybe the loss of his head, if Tiberius hears about it. He's in an impossible situation. So he's even more afraid. He's even more afraid of Caesar is what it comes down to. And he really only has two options here. Put to death an innocent man, give in to the demands of the Jews, which he can't stand, and, and condemn an innocent man to die, or let him go and face revolt, riots. Save his soul or save his neck. There's something kind of intangible about your soul, isn't there? Where is it? I don't know. Is it inside behind my tie? Where is your soul? There's something very tangible about your neck, right? My soul? I don't know what that is exactly. I know what my neck is. In Mark 8, 36, Jesus says, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but forfeit his soul? The question of Jesus is that question. It's the question of your soul. So once more, he questions Jesus. He brings him back in for questioning. And he says, where are you from? That is a very interesting question. Pilate knows where he's from. He knows about this guy. He has spies and informants out there. He knows the charges. He's heard about Jesus, the Galilean from Nazareth. He's not confused about his geography. What's he really saying when he says, where are you from? What is Pilate asking? Who are you really? Are you really from a different kingdom? Who are you that I can't seem to get out from under this question and that they want you dead so badly? And when he asks him where he's from, Jesus responds with silence. Total silence. When Jesus is silent again, Isaiah 53, verse 7, he opened not his mouth before his accusers. He's fulfilling prophecy there. Pilate's frustrated. He says, you're not going to talk to me? Really? You're going to be quiet now? Don't you realize who I am? Don't you know what I have the power to do? This is where the story gets incredibly tense. Don't you realize I have the authority to put you to death or to set you free? But he doesn't have the courage to do either one of them, does he? He says, I have the authority to condemn you to die or to set you free. But he doesn't have the courage to make that decision. And Jesus responds. Now Jesus speaks. When Pilate claims authority over him, now Jesus speaks. And what he says, I hope you walk away with. I hope it resonates in your heart. I hope you think about it. Jesus says, essentially, my life is not in your hands, Pilate. And your authority does not come from Caesar. And I'm not actually the one on trial here, despite how it looks. I love his reply. And I think you and I deeply need to hear this today in our country at this time in our country's life. And let it soak into our minds as Christ followers in the world today. Let me read it again to you. Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. You have no authority except, except that which comes from God. What power you think you have, Pilate, does not come from Rome or from Caesar. And in all of this, by the way, Pilate, this mockery of a trial, this sham of, a, of, of an accusation, the beatings and the scourging and all that's happening, all of this, by the way, is not by your doing, though you think it is. And it's not by their doing, the mob or the crowd or the Jewish leaders. All of this is happening exactly as God wills it and plans it. Romans chapter 13, verse 1 says, There is no authority on earth except that which has been established by God. That's a hard pill to swallow when your candidate is not elected. Acts 2.23 says that Jesus was offered up and crucified according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Jesus is saying, Pilate, 
You're not in control here. God is. This is not out of control. I know exactly what's happening here. Let me say it this way. God is able to bring about his purposes even through the actions of sinful rulers and leaders who do not even acknowledge him or his authority. The Savior of the world was not in the Sanhedrin. He was not in Rome. He was not on the throne of any earthly kingdom. But God is able to use both of those power groups to bring about that salvation. So that, Think about that for a minute. How would it feel in that moment to be a follower of Jesus, to be one of the crowd? Who's in control here? Who's calling the shots here? Is it the Jewish Sanhedrin? Is it the mob? Is it Pilate? Is it Caesar? It's none of them. God is able to bring about his purposes for the salvation of the world through men and who don't even acknowledge he exists or that he has authority over their lives. Let me put it to you this way. Our God is able to work out his ultimate purposes even through the candidate you believe is a terrible mistake. Now, I'm not telling you who that is. But you might have your ideas. Our God is not threatened by that. He's not freaked out in heaven going, what are they doing down there? He's not unsure of how he's going to work this all out now. He's not terrified thinking, now what are we going to do? Because his kingdom is bigger than the United States of America. And his plan is bigger than the salvation of our nation, politically speaking. I'm not saying voting doesn't matter. I'm not saying candidates don't make a difference. They do. There's a price to pay for bad decisions in your life, in your business, in your family, in our country, in the world. What I'm saying is God is bigger than that. And he's ultimately able to bring about what he wills and purposes, even through stuff that looks to us like it can't be right. How can God redeem this? Nothing in your life, in your family, in our country, in this world, is ever so out of control that God can't redeem it. Nothing. Which is not to say he doesn't grieve over things. He does. But don't despair. And Jesus says to Pilate, Pilate, you don't see what's happening here. You don't have authority. You don't have power. Let's finish the passage. Verses 12 through 16. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. <laughs> like he's been doing it all along, right? But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and an Aramaic Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour, that's noon. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him. Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. Pilate's still trying to get out from underneath the question of Jesus, isn't he? Still trying to find a way out. He has the authority, he says, to put him to death or to set him free, but he doesn't have the courage to make that call either way. In the end, neither Pilate nor you nor I nor any other person can escape the ultimate question of Jesus. In the end, you have to make a choice. In the end, you have to pick a side. In the end, you have to just figure out where you stand. And not to decide is to decide. Here, finally, Pilate makes his choice. Friend of Caesar or friend of Jesus? The Jews say, they put it right to him, right? If you set him free, you're no friend of Caesar. That's sticking the knife in deep now for Pilate. That's his greatest fear. And by friend of Caesar, we don't just mean Tiberius the man. We mean aligning your heart with the power structures and value systems of this world. Or aligning your heart and life with the sacrificial love and selflessness of the gospel. Those are the choices. Friend of Caesar, friend of Jesus. There is no middle ground. So Pilate brings Jesus out to this place they call the stone pavement. I've actually been there. See an image here on the screen, I believe. Unless I forgot to send them. Oh, I'm looking out here, that's me. Uh, that's first century streets right around the place where they believe was Pilate's headquarters outside the temple. The next image is the closest the archaeologists can guess to what was called Gabata, the stone pavement. A big courtyard, open air courtyard, and today it's 30 feet underground. You have to go down these tunnels underneath the temple area. 
And the stone pavement then, he would sit on what was called the bima, judgment seat, and pass sentence on the condemned. You see the irony there? Pilate says to Jesus, who is truth, what is truth? Pilate sits on a judgment seat over the one who will someday come to judge all people, all men, all women. So it was an overwhelming thing to put my hands on those stones and to think that Jesus might have stood here, walked here, Faced that here. Made it real, you know, in a way sometimes this stuff becomes so distant for, from us, like it's good to think about it Christmas and an Easter, but we don't really dive into the significance of it. It's real. It's a real choice we face. Whether or not you ever touch those stones. In verses 14 and 15, one last time, Pilate appeals to the crowd, shall I crucify your king? Like one last appeal, like really? Are you gonna, is this what it's gonna be? And they say it, we have no king but Caesar, which they meant as sort of a hypocritical mockery, right? To, to, to kind of stick it to Pilate. But it's true. God was not their king in that moment. Friends, the question of Jesus is inescapable for Pontius Pilate, for you and for me. In Matthew's account of this very same story, he says in verse 27, chapter, uh, chapter 27, verse 22, Pilate quotes, this is Pilate's words, what then shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? That's the question for you. What then shall you do with Jesus who is called Christ? What are you going to do with him? C.S. Lewis famously once said about this very question, you can shut him up for a fool, you can call him a liar or worse, or you can bow down and worship him. But let us not come to him with any of this placating nonsense about him being a great moral teacher. He's not left that option open to us. He did not intend to. This is the question Pilate faced, and I think it's the question we all face. Your great fear, my great fear, and I, I, don't, I, I confess it's not always this way, but my great fear ought, it should never be losing something that I consider good in this life. I, I mean, I, I do fear that. And some of you have had great loss in your life, and you know what I'm talking about. But the greatest fear of my heart and your heart should never be to lose something you think is good in this life. The greatest fear should be to lose the love of God offered to us in Jesus. To not tap into that. And here's the thing. Once you have it, it can never be taken from you. Once you receive it through the grace of Jesus, it can't be taken from you. Jesus, at once upon a time, stood on those stone, on that, in that pavement, and he faced a judgment, a condemnation of Pilate. Jesus, who is innocent, faced an unjust and corrupt court to receive an unjust sentence, death. And he did that, why? So that you and I, who are guilty, could face the judgment when he returns and receive life. Because there's coming a day when he will stand on the judgment seat. And every knee will bow, and every tongue confess. Just some of them will be willingly, and others won't. That's the question you face. Jesus, who was innocent, bore the guilt and condemnation that was due us so that we who are guilty might receive liberation, freedom, forgiveness. That's the message of Jesus Christ. That's the message of this week that's coming up, Holy Week. I don't know all of you here. I know some of you better than others. But God knows every one of your hearts. He knows everything about you. He knows whether you've ever really faced this question or not. The question of Jesus. It is inescapable, friends. You must decide what you will do with Jesus who is called the Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we... We pause now to acknowledge that we are often so consumed with the wrong things, worried about our, the petty events of our daily lives, consumed with passing judgment on others, minor irritations, having our way, offenses to our ego, fear of the future. And when we pause now and, and focus in on who you are and what you did for us, we can only humbly come to you and say, God, we have been so blind. We just ask that you would open our eyes this week 
to see clearly the choice before us. Help us by your grace and spirit to reject the power structures and the value systems of this world and to choose you. We pray it in your name, Jesus, and for your sake. Amen.